And it is good to see you, and I want to <clears throat> thank all those fellows that go and get air conditioners and putting in. We, we had an air conditioner to go bad, a unit. And uh, these fellows worked on it, put it in, and, and traveled to get the thing. <clears throat> five ton, right? Five ton unit. And don't forget, hey, I, I don't uh, bother you about this, but the, those things cost money. Don't ever forget that. I don't ever ask you to, to give to anything that's not necessary to have. But uh, if our air conditioners go out, all y'all be complaining. And you blame it on me, and so I appreciate all these guys that fix it. Right? Right, Stan? I mean, you've got to say something, Stan, because you're the treasurer, and you're just sitting over there. Like, mm -hmm, okay. <laughs> you take that hit, preacher. <laughs> it is good to see you. God bless you for being here uh, today. And I want to talk to you about a convenient religion, and that's not a good thing to have. It's not a good thing to have. I'm going to talk about uh, that today. Although a lot of people seek a, a, a religion of convenience. And you, you say, well, what does that mean? That means this. A lot of people do this. If I don't have anything else that I want to do or I would like to do or somebody can talk me into or that I can just think up in my mind, I might go to church and worship the Lord. That's a convenient religion. But there's more to it than that, a lot more. Will you pray with me? Father, we ask you to use this time. Help us to see that you have called us to live according to your word. That you have called us to deny ourselves. Literally to deny ourselves, meaning to die to ourselves. Take up your cross and follow you daily, every day. Help us to see that that's what you call for. That's not preacher talk, but that's what you said. I ask you, God, to help us all to see that as we look at Jeroboam's life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I want you to look at uh, 1 Kings 12, which is a, a pivotal uh, chapter in the book of Kings. Actually, it's a pivotal chapter on, uh, for earth when everything changed there. With uh, the kingdom of Israel, a lot of things began to take place, and a lot of stuff that started to take place there, you literally, whether you believe it or not, you still deal with it even to this day. You can turn on your news, and you will see some of this stuff as it plays out. You, you can when you look at uh, the world in, as we live in it today. Now, at the end of chapter 11, we find that Solomon has died. He died, he did not finish well, and we've talked about that before. And he left his son, a guy named Rehoboam, to be king of Israel, of all of Israel. Now, Rehoboam called all the people of Israel together at a place called Shechem. Okay, Shechem. Now, that, you say that with more guttural, but I, I don't have that right now. Uh, but Shechem had been the rallying place uh, for the tribes of Israel, all these people to come uh, together and renew their covenant with God at various times. Therefore, it was a natural place. It was just a natural place uh, to hold the coronation for a king. Okay, So they were all going to Shechem uh, for a coronation. But there was this guy. His name was Jeroboam. We've looked at him some. We'll look at him some more today. He had long been an enemy of King Solomon. And when he found out that King Solomon had died and that naturally Rehoboam was going to become king, he comes back. He comes back to Israel. Now, he had a conflict with uh, Solomon. Solomon at one time saw Rehoboam as a great leader. I mean, uh, Jeroboam as a great leader. And he appointed him to a high position within the kingdom. But then Jeroboam had a rebellion. But actually, the rebellion in his heart, and this is hard to explain, I'll not deal with it a whole lot today, God had something to do with that. Because God had told Solomon, what? I'm going to take the kingdom from you. I'm going to take the kingdom from you. 
I'm going to give the greater part of it to someone else. I will leave your son with one tribe to protect the lineage of David, and that goes all the way to the gospel, really, because Jesus comes from the household of David. God was protecting that. But he told Solomon this. And so back up there, I'm going to read to you just a little bit in the 11th chapter so you'll get this idea where the tension was, the hatred was between Jeroboam and Solomon. Okay, listen to this. 1 Kings 11, I'm going to begin in the 29th verse. It came about at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shulamite, found him on the road. Now Ahijah had clothed himself with a new cloak, and both of them were alone in the field. Then Ahijah took hold of the new cloak, which was on him, and tore it into twelve pieces. He said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give you ten tribes. But he will have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen of all the tribes of Israel. I'm going to tell you something, folks. You will never defeat Israel. That's never going to happen. A lot of stuff may be said. And that does not mean that every person who lives in Jerusalem or Israel is a God-fearing human being. L listen to me. There's a lot of heathens there, okay, just like here. Don't, don't mess that up. Don't, don't rewrite Scripture. But God is going to preserve Jerusalem. That's going to happen because he has intentions for it at the end of time. All right? And it's not based upon the fact, and the Scripture actually says this, and people don't even quote this. It, it's, it's not based upon the fact that all Hebrews are good. That's not true. And any Hebrew that's going to heaven, you know, he doesn't have a punch ticket already to the pearly gates, so to speak. If a Hebrew goes to heaven, he's got to repent and believe the gospel just like anybody else. But God does have intentions for uh, that part of the world in his world scope plan of redemption of all of his creation. Now, he's chosen uh, uh, Jerusalem from all the tribes of Israel because they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashereth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Kokomish, the god of Moab, Milcom, the god of the sons of Ammon, and they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight, and observing my statutes and my ordinances as his father David did. Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand. That's double emphasis there. But I will make him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose, who observed my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom from his son's hands and give it to you, even ten tribes. But to his son I will give one tribe. That my servant David may have a lamp always before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen for myself to put my name. Double emphasis again. I will take you and you shall reign over whatever you desire, and you shall be king over Israel. Then it will be that if you listen to all that I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight by observing my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build you an enduring house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. Thus I will afflict the descendants of David, but not always, okay? But not always. And that's an eschatological statement about the end of time. They will return. Now listen, when Solomon heard this, when he heard that Jeroboam was going to get the major part of Israel, well, he decided to hate Jeroboam. Now, he didn't say, well, you know, it's my fault. He decided to hate Jeroboam, and he tried to have Jeroboam killed, but God protected Jeroboam and let him escape down into Egypt, okay? He sent him down into Egypt, and there he lived until Solomon uh, was on his deathbed, so to speak. Now, that's some intrigue, right? Somebody ought to make 
a movie out of that, right? Jeroboam and Solomon. That'd be a better movie than, than this what? What is it? I, I saw one of y'all put on Facebook how many Hallmark Christmas movies are about to appear. That burdens my soul. <laughs> don't, don't say that. I saw that too. Your son-in-law is going to be in one. That may be the only one I watch. <laughs> but this would make this would make a good better than James Bond. I mean, all this intrigue in this story uh, right here. Now, it is also strange when you look at this. It is somewhat strange that with all the wives and all the concubines that Solomon had, the only son that's ever mentioned is Rehoboam. Okay, the wisest man in the world had a nutcase for a son. And that's really true, as you'll see that uh, shortly. He followed him as king, but he's the only son ever mentioned in the whole scripture from Solomon. That's amazing, isn't it? Wow. Now listen to this. I want to read to you the first three verses there of the 12th uh, chapter, if you will. And it says this to us. Then Rehoboam, now that's Solomon's son, went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. Now when Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, heard of it, he was living in Egypt, for he was yet in Egypt, where he had fled from the presence of King Solomon. Then they sent, they sent, the northern tribes, the ten tribes, they sent, and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel, they sent for Jeroboam, and all of the assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam. Okay? Uh, now, and, and what they basically said to him uh, was what? Your daddy, Solomon, was a hard taskmaster. Now, why would they say that? Well, Solomon had, uh, you know, he, he started a draft. And he started a draft of Israelites in order to do what? Two things. Build his palace and build the temple. And they built it. Okay? And a lot of people resented that. But they said, you know, you need to lighten up on us. Don't charge us so many taxes like your daddy did. And if you will lighten up and quit charging us so much tax. And look, the temple was already built. The, the palace was already built. There was no reason to go on with this forced labor thing, but they did. You know, sometimes when things start and they should end, then they don't end. Now, a lot of you could start talking all about that, and, but you, that's true. That's always been true in any political system, and Israel had a political system, but it was forced labor. And so they said, look, man, get off that kick and give us some freedom. You don't need to be famous on our backs in blood. Re really and truly, that, that's there. Well, Rehoboam does what? Well, he goes to Shechem to be crowned as the king of Israel. But he's not thinking this thing through because surely he knew, just like everybody else knew, God is going to rip part of the kingdom away. God's not going to let me rule it all. But he was greedy. He was sinful. He was self-possessed. And so what does he do? He goes out there to be crowned king, but guess who showed up for dinner? Y'all remember that movie? Guess who's coming to dinner? I love that movie. I love it. But, but Jeroboam, show, Jeroboam shows up for dinner. He's uh, come all the way from Egypt, and the Hebrews had enlisted him to go up to Shechem to, to lead them in their request, you know, to Jeroboam to lighten up the tax load, man. To lighten it up and, and to lighten this work burden you put on all of us. And Solomon had placed this on them, like I said, when he was building the temple and, and, and building his own palace. You know, a lot of years there. A lot of years. And they said to him, if, if you'll lighten up this burden that your father put on us, we'll serve you. We, we will submit to you as king. Well, Boehm says, well, fellas, look here. Y'all give me three days to think about this. Give me three days, okay? And I'll, I'll think about it. And you come back, and I'll give you an answer, okay? You know. 
you ever went somewhere to talk to somebody and they said to you, well, give me a little time to think about it, but before you left, you already knew what they were going to do. You know, if you ever tell somebody you're going to think about something, think about it. Don't lie. Rehoboam was lying. Okay, he was lying. He, he knew what he was doing. And, and I'll, I'll prove that in just, just a moment. So Rehoboam asked them, like I said, to give him, give him the three days before I answer, and then he consulted with the old counselors that his father had always used. Wise men who understood the government. They understood the people of Israel. They were out among the people. They had lived, and they understood a lot of things. Look, let me tell you something. I'm for millennials. Don't spit in the face of a gray hair. Because those gray heads, they know some junk you don't know yet. And you know what amazes me? I've had the opportunity to rear three generations of humans. Okay? I got Gen Xers, and, you know, and afterburners, and millennials, and then some of them, they ain't named them yet because they don't know what they are. I mean, really, sociology hadn't named them yet, right? There's a generation that they can't even name yet. That's amazing to me. Yeah. Are you going to name them? They're going to give you that opportunity? All right. I, well, don't call them what you've been calling them. <laughs> joking. I'm joking, Dr. Stumbo. <laughs> you know, I love you. I feel for you. But listen, they say to him, they, they've been around. They know. They understand the scene. They understand the people. They know what's going on. They know that the seeds of rebellion have been being sown in Israel for several years. They know that it's coming to a boiling point. They know that when Solomon had finished that palace, there was no reason on earth for him to continue with this forced labor and this high taxation. He was just doing that because it had been con convenient and profitable to him, and he had also lost focus on worshiping God. See, when leaders lose focus on God, you're doomed. Listen, so he asked them, and they said, Well, look, Rehoboam, if you lighten that load, if you treat these people right, and you know, in any kind of leadership, that ought to be true. If you treat people right, they'll help you. They'll work. But if you treat people like a dog, well, as soon as they can, they're going to bite your heel, right? And a big dog will bite up a little higher. But, you know, get, get that in your mind. They said, they'll, they'll serve you forever. Rehoboam, he said, nah, I ain't doing that. See, he already knew. He was just trying to look cool. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to listen to you guys. I, you know, I know my daddy did and all that. And all y'all said he was the wisest man in the world. But Rehoboam's the king now. I'm the man now, you know. It's kind of like, you know, Denzel Washington in that movie. You know, King Kong ain't got nothing on me. Y'all remember that? that was, yeah. All right, that's where he was. He refused wise counsel. Then he goes to the younger guys that he had grown up with. Not that they were counselors, and, there's, and many young people are good counselors, Okay. They walk with Jesus, they know, they have some God-given wisdom. That's not why we're knocking here. But he goes just to the guys that grew up with him, his gang, his buds, all his BFFs, right? You know, how many of y'all, first time you ever heard of a BFF, you were trying to rear children? I didn't know what that was. I thought that was some kind of cussing. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. What does that mean? Whoa, here. What, what, what? Let me see that phone. What is that? I want to know what that is. Best friend forever. <laughs> you know, blow your mind. Okay. But that's who he went and talked to, and they gave him some bad advice. Because, hey, their buddy's the king now. This can put them in good places. So they gave him some bad advice. Uh, so they, they told him, I don't listen to that. Tell them that, your daddy, you know, his rule was as thick as a little finger, but your rule is going to be as thick as your waist. You tell them that my daddy might have whipped you with whips, but I'm going to whip you with scorpions. 
And when he says scorpions there, you look that up, he's not talking about bugs, okay? There was a whip back then that they tied glass in, or not glass, but pieces of bone and sharp instruments in the end of it, and if you were beaten with it, it would rip your skin off. Actually, the cat of nine tails that they used to crucify Je- when they crucified Jesus to whip him was such an instrument. It had barbs on the end of it, metal barbs in it, and it ripped his skin off of his back when you, when you read that story. But he said, I'll whip you till you run red with blood. Oh, okay. When he tells them that he's going to be harder on them than his daddy had been, when they heard this, the ten northern tribes, the northern tribes, they revolted on the spot. And they grabbed Jeroboam, and he knew it was going to happen because he'd already been told by the prophet of God, God himself, this is going to happen. All he had to do was wait in shadows. That's all he had to do. They made Jeroboam king of the ten tribes. It is true that God left Judah, which actually incorporated Benjamin and part of uh, uh, the Levites also, but left him one tribe. So Rehoboam thinks, I'm not putting up with that. You're not going to do me that way. So he sends one of his officials out to talk to these people, and guess what they did to that official? You know that old Roman story about killing the messenger? They picked up big rocks, and they killed that rascal. They said, forget it. We got our own kick. We can kill you. And then Rehoboam had to take off in a chariot for his own life because they would have killed him too. And he goes back to Jerusalem, and then he says, what? I'll get them. I'll go to war. I'll take it back. But God, through another prophet named Shemaiah, said, you do not do that because I spoke and I told your daddy I would take the kingdom out of his hand, but not in his lifetime, in yours. And so Rehoboam did not attack the northern kingdom, which had he done so, Judah would have died. He only had 180,000 soldiers, period at that time. They would have been dead. No hope. They couldn't have won that battle. That was pride of a leader. Pride's a killer, isn't it? It's a killer. So, the kingdom of Israel was now split. There was what we call, and and anytime you're looking at church or, or the history of Israel, you'll hear about the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. You'll hear that all uh, the time, okay, because it goes all the way through uh, to the end. But now the whole kingdom of Israel is split, it's gone, it's torn apart. Rehoboam ruled the southern kingdom, Jeroboam ruled the northern kingdom. What had taken David and Solomon 80 years to build, Rehoboam in his pride blew it up in one day. Isn't that amazing? You know what? Unity is the most fragile thing there is to protect in anything. In your family, in government, in a church, unity is the most fragile thing. I I told a lot of young preachers, what you've got to watch more than anything else, you've got to guard this. You've got to do what you have to do to take care of the unity in your church because if unity is breached, a split will come. And that's that's a hard job because unity is fragile, okay? It's like, you know, the most fragile thing in, in, in the world. But now that brings us to where we are. A convenient religion quickly Jeroboam he goes to the north he goes up there he starts being the king now God had told him hey if you'll follow me I'll bless you I'll give you anything you want I'll take care of you you'll be fine I'll give you stuff just like I gave David you know what was God saying I'll bless both kingdoms follow me trust me and I'll take care of you But look at what this guy does. Look at here. 25th verse of this chapter. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. Now he could have lived there and served there and worshipped God there and been a good king there. But he didn't do it. 
He went out from there and built Penuel. Jeroboam said in his heart, in his own heart, now the kingdom will return to the house of David if this people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will return to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Look at who planted that seed in his head. It was not God. God had already told him, I'm going to take care of you. Satan had come on the scene, right? Now, buddy, you better listen to me. If you let them people go down and worship God like he said for them to worship, they will kill you. They won't want to be doing that. But see, that's not true. That was a lie that was planted in this guy's head. Now, watch. So the king consulted. Now, he, you know, he sought him some counselors too. Listen, listen, listen. When you're looking for somebody to counsel you, find somebody with good sense. Find somebody that's level. Find somebody that's not a yes man or a yes woman. Okay, have you ever noticed that what some leaders do that hurt their lives and their ministries or running a country or a school or anything else? They surround themselves with yes men. And anything they say, the yes men will back it up. You know, if the leader, you know, goes a little nuts and says, well, there's no such thing as stars. That's just a reflection off my heart. It's so beautiful. You know, then them yes men say, that's right, buddy. There ain't no stars. It's just the king's hair. Long live the hair. You know, it's foolishness. But that happens constantly. I just watched it happen in the downfall of uh, my old boss just, just recently. Surround yourself with yes men, and you're dead. So he consulted with somebody, nobody that was going to say, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. God said we're to worship at Jerusalem. God said we're not supposed to worship false gods. God said he would tell us who to worship and how to worship. God appointed our priest. You can't do that. Nobody said that. There's a bunch of yes men. So then, after this consultation, he made two golden calves, and he said to them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. You know, what was he saying? Well, it's going to be a little inconvenient if you go down to Jerusalem, boys. Now, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to build you a place to worship here. You can hang out here. You don't even have to, you don't have to do much. You know? There's no sacrifice in that. You ain't got to load up your donkey or anything. Just come on downtown with us. You know? Because he says it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you up from the land of Egypt. And there's a lot there. He's really synchronized the worship of Jehovah with other things. I, I don't have time to go into that, but, you know, about, you know, worship God, but do it in this way. You don't have to really worship God like God said for you to worship in his book. You can, you can do it this way, and it'll work just as well. Okay, okay, sound familiar? Yes. He set one of these in Bethel and the other in Dan. Now, this thing became sin. I, it was sin immediately. This came, thing became sin for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. Wow. What was he doing there? Well, you know what he was doing. He was creating a, a convenient religion to protect his own kingdom so that people would like him, you know. Sometimes we want to do that. That, that happens to preachers. Preachers begin to say, well, I can't preach on that. You know, I can't, you know, I know what I'll do. I'll just preach on homosexualism. Everybody hates that. And they'll all pat me on the back. He says, but I ain't touching adultery because we got people doing that. And they'll be mad at me and they won't put in the offering. Well, guess what, folks? That's just as much sin as is homosexuality. Do you understand that? Get that in your head. Sin is sin. Okay? And you can't pick and choose. You know, it's not, you know, Christianity is not a cafeteria, you know. It's like the old lunchroom where they hand you that plate and say, this is it, eat this or starve, we don't care. Right? It's kind of like in our house, isn't it? Nan says, here's dinner, eat it. If you don't eat it, well, good luck. <laughs> you know, but it's always good for us. Now look, listen, Jeroboam had created his own religion 
to satisfy the people of Israel, or the northern kingdom now, to keep them from going down to Jerusalem to really worship God, it was a convenient religion. A convenient religion. That's, that's exactly what Jeroboam did. And that's what a lot of people do even today. It's been going on forever. Actually, Nimrod was doing this back in the 11th chapter of Genesis. That's exactly what he was doing when he said, let's just build us a tower to heaven. We'll worship God like we want to. We got this down. Right? And then that's when God said, no, you don't. Convenient religion here, like Jeroboam had, you know, I mean, he didn't, I'm not saying that everybody's built them a golden calf and put it out in their yard, right? What we have today is them concrete frogs put in the yard. I want to tell you something, if you've got a concrete frog in the yard, that really ain't pretty. You know, just, just get some real frogs. <laughs> I'll, I'll get it over that one. Somebody go, I painted mine, it is pretty. <laughs> yeah. What people are doing today is developing a religion that's very convenient to them and calling it Christianity. Happens all the time. A guy, now you, you can't make this stuff up. Christian Smith, who is a Christian researcher, no joke, his name is Christian Smith, and his occupation is, he, that's what he does, he is a Christian researcher, and guess what? He's at the University of North Carolina. That amazes me even more because I had a son that went there. Well, that's another story. But look, Christian Smith, he's a Christian researcher, as I said. He's given uh, the newest form of convenient religion in America a name. He gave it a name. He looked at it for years and he gave it this name. He calls it moralistic therapeutic deism. Let me describe it for you a little bit. He says that this new religion or, or moralistic, the, therapeutic, you know, I'm just going to call it MTD because I can't handle that, you know. All right. Consists of beliefs like this. Now listen, let, let me give you this quickly here. Watch. A God does exist. A God does exist. Not the God, but a God. Okay. Be careful when you read stuff like that. A God does exist who created the world and watches over human life on earth. Second thing, God wants people to be good, be nice, and be fair to each other like the Bible, watch, and other religious books teach. The Koran, all, all that. You know, like they all teach. Meaning what, what does that do? That gives other religious books equality with the Word of God. That's a mistake. That's a red flag. Third thing. The central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about yourself. Be happy. Don't worry. Y'all remember that? Yeah. A fourth thing, God does not need to be involved in your personal life. Ooh, meaning you can control this. If you decide you want to do something, hey, if you're not hurting anybody else, it's okay. No, it's not. It's not okay. But they said, you know, God doesn't have to be involved in your personal life except, watch, here's the exception, except when you need something or you have a problem you cannot solve on your own. Boy, that's a striker right there. You know what? I need God when I'm in trouble. I, I see this on the internet all the time. Oh, when I'm in trouble, I call on God. Or they do it like this. Whatever I can't handle, I'm going to give to God. That's a suicide note. That's a suicide note. Let me, let me tell you something. You can't handle any of it. None of us can handle it. If we start running it, the boat's going to sink, okay? Your boat don't float unless God is not in the passenger seat, but he's driving the boat, okay? Because we will run that thing aground, all right? We will be like the Titanic. This boat's unsinkable. It is a great witness to the wonderful inventive nature of mankind and what did it do first time out it made Leonardo DiCaprio famous <laughs> right. but and then a fifth thing here is watch this get this this is dangerous all people who have been good go to heaven when they die 
It's like that movie, All Dogs Go to Heaven. You know? All people who have been good. Uh, now, all this I've shared with you, good according to whose standard is one thing you got to look at. The Bible says none of us are good. Jesus said don't call anybody good. Only the Father is good. But all people who have been good go to heaven when they die. Now, you can call this if, uh, convenient religion or, you know, what, what Christian Smith uh, calls a moralistic, therapeutic deism. You can call it, really, if you want to, to make it easy to grasp whatever makes you happy, religion. Whatever makes you happy, baby. You know? This religion of convenience is about taking a moralistic approach to life. It's very moral according to human morality, not God's morality. There is a difference. It teaches that the basic element of living a good and happy life is being a good and a moral person according to the morals you've set up for yourself. That's it. In addition, these things. The ideal Christian, they believe this is, the ideal Christian is a person who is nice, always kind, always pleasant, always respectful of all lifestyles. Now, when I say this, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not telling you not to give people human respect. But there are things in this world that are wrong. But, you know, this idea is, you know, just respect anything. Finding godly value, watch this, this is dangerous. Finding godly value in anyone's way of life as long as they are sincere. That goes way back. Down. Well, she's so sincere. Well, he really, really believes that. So that makes him okay. Because he's honest. At least he's not a hypocrite. And then they throw in that favorite Bible verse, judge not, at least you be judged. Yeah, come on now, y'all know I'm right. Another thing here, in addition, the ideal Christian is responsible, tolerant of all others always working on self-improvement in order to get along with all other people, okay? We're supposed to work toward improvement in our life that we glorify God. That's why we do that. Because if you're glorifying God, you're not going to get along with everybody. People are going to hate you. They crucified Jesus. Now, he was the kindest, most gentle person that ever lived. The Old Testament says he would not even bruise a reed. Wow. But, you know, that's, that's why you work on self-improvement. Behavior modification, all that stuff. Listen, you know, get along with everybody, take care of your health, which we ought to do, obviously. <laughs> you know, doing one's best to be successful in whatever you decide. You want your lifestyle to be, no matter what it is. As long as you're successful, that's okay. Lastly here, those who practice this new religion of convenience consider any who have strong theological convictions, such as believing that there's only one way to heaven. You know, a lot of people today believe there are many ways to heaven. If you really stick to it, that's a lie. That's a lie from hell. The father of that lie is Satan himself. He's been spewing that since the day he walked up on Eve in the Garden of Eden. It's old. It's not new. It's not that we have progressed mentally and socially so much. We are circular. We continue to go back and grasp that which kills us. People are still petting rattlesnakes and trying to call it a ring neck. You know, look, folks, a rattlesnake is a rattlesnake. If you kiss one, he will bite you, and you might die or never talk well again. Okay? That's just true. And Satan is the devil, and he hates you. He hates the church of the living God, and he will do anything to modify it according to his concepts, because according to his concepts, he can take the whole thing to hell. Now, these things are true. This is just true and this is where we are in our culture right now look this is point of spear stuff folks the old testament does tell us about jesus but it always tells us about where culture is 
It always reveals things about where we live and the heart of man, okay? Now look, it's hard to pull all this stuff out of there, but it's always uh, there. If you, if you have strong theological convictions, such as believing that there's only one way to heaven, or that the Bible is the word of God, and nothing else is the word. Look, listen, this is the word of God. Other religious books are not the word of God. They are counterfeit. Now, as soon as I say that, people's brains may think in a certain way, What? and this is how it happens. When you have those strong convictions, people that have grasped this new, convenient religious concept, here's where they are. They think you are ignorant and tolerant, and that your voice should be marginalized. I don't pay any attention to them. They're crazy. They also say, yeah, I believe there's a God. Let me tell you something. Just saying that you believe there is a God has never been nor ever will be synonymous with an expression of saving faith. Demons believe there's a God and they tremble, but they are not saved. That's what James said. You know, they believe we must be completely tolerant of every other belief that would ever come along, no matter what it is. Otherwise, we're just being judgmental. There it goes, you know, people's favorite verse. Judge not least you be judged. And they're pulling that out, that out of context every time they use it. I've heard that so many times in my life. It's just like, you know, I just, I don't care. I don't care. When people say that to me, it just... It's just like me eating a hot dog. You know, say it again. Go ahead. Put more mustard on it. Yeah. Yeah. Look. They think it's judgmental to suggest that anyone could actually be wrong in matters of faith and doctrine or the Bible. Well, whatever you believe is right for you. That's crazy. That's not true. What if you went to your doctor? I'm thinking about doctors a lot lately. So are many of you. What if, what if you went to your doctor and she said, well, you know, you're, you're pretty well educated. What do you think I ought to do? Because whatever you say is what we'll do because we can't make a bad decision here or we can't make a bad incision. Hey, if I get the wrong leg, that's okay. It don't matter. Well, you would do what? Fire the doctor. You'd say, are you insane? Get me a nurse and get me out of here. Give me back my clothes. You know, right now, I'm gone. If you don't get my clothes, I'm leaving like this. You, know, you wouldn't put up with that, would you? And you'd be crazy if you did. But this comes out of, about faith. Oh, nothing's actually wrong. Whatever you believe the Bible teaches is what is right for you. A suicide pill, folks. Again, it, or they say, the Bible says, oh, this is dangerous. I've heard this in Sunday school classes. Not here. I've never heard this in my Sunday school class. Okay? I've heard a lot of opinions, but never this. Okay? All right? People say this. The Bible says one thing to one person and something else to another person, and we have no right to say one is wrong and the other is right. Look, here's what's right. This is right. And the rest of us are wrong. If my opinion is not here, then I'm wrong. If I, my thoughts, my actions, and my conduct do not go according to the scripture, I'm wrong. It, that's all there is to it. This is the standard. There is no other standard. All right. Now, let me quickly just say this, folks. This convenient religion is killing America. This convenient religion is killing the nation. It's killing the world. It's sending people to hell. You know, I was in a conference yesterday and my soul was burdened. And I'm thinking about uh, teenagers and stuff. And, you know, I'm thinking, Lord, we have got to help them understand the biblical gospel. We, the leaders, if, if, if we don't, they're going to hell. We've got to teach them the truth. That's, that's why what, what we're trying to do is create an environment where we evangelize and disciple people as best we can because they got to know the truth. My friend, if I don't follow Jesus, I'm doomed. 
I'm doomed. As a Christian, if I, don't, if I go away from Jesus and just try to be convenient and be cool, I will crash and burn. Now, I don't mean go to hell, but I'll be like Solomon. I'll be done. And I'm nowhere near as smart as Solomon. I'll be done quicker. You know, like in a day, you will too. You know, when I was doing my doctoral research, one, one, one thing, probably about the only thing that I still retain, because when you start writing that dissertation, your brain collapses. But the one thing I retain is this. Worldwide, some researchers, good researchers, because you can't, you can't put Wikipedia research in a doctoral dissertation. They'll fail you, because Wikipedia is not a source. Listen to me. Only 4% of adult males on Earth, I don't know how they came to this, but this is long research. Only 4% of adult males on Earth live according to a biblical worldview. Only 4% of adult males on Earth, whole population live according to a biblical worldview. And then we're trying to figure out what happened. We know what happened. We're not following God as a people. And when people say to me that the Southern Baptist Convention is crashing, and I know it is, I know it is. I know it is. And they come in up and say, what are we going to do? What are we going to do to fix it? Here's the only thing we can do follow God. Repent and follow Jesus. Stay focused on Jesus. If you're here and you're a Christian, biblical faith is the only faith we can practice that pleases God. We've got to follow Jesus. What did he say for us to do? Again, die to myself. Take up the cross of Christ and follow him every day. Otherwise, I'm messed up. That's it. If you're here and you're not a believer, look, it's hard for you today because you hear so many weird things. But here's the truth. If you'll just recognize that you're lost before a just and righteous God, if you will repent of sin and believe the gospel, he'll save you. That's a fact. That's all you got to know. Because it's the Holy Spirit that reveals that to you, not another person, really. It's God. I'm going to pray now. If you're here, you don't know Jesus, these ladies are going to lead us an invitation. You come. But, but my Christian friend, look at here. We live in a time where we must get serious. Because our world's falling apart, and the only hope it has is Jesus. It's Jesus. Lord, just move us. Help us not to just seek a convenient religion that just... It's a what not on the coffee table. Lord, God, help us to surrender our lives to you every day, to obey you and to commit to you, spend time with you, learn of you, and follow you no matter what the sacrifice or the cost because that's what you said for us to do. Not, that's not preacher talk, Lord. I, I hate preacher talk. I just ask you to speak to our hearts from truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing? You come.